Hello, everyone. My name is Jöran Henriks, and I have the great privilege to introduce two persons that have led healthcare quality thinking to a new level. But before I do that, I just want to send a big thank you to Copenhagen and Denmark for all the investments they have done for the BMJ IHI International Conference and how they have helped our movement to stay crispy and vital during this time of the pandemic. Denmark is Europe's grain farm and I think they now also become the harvest center for the harvest festival and I would love to see all people harvesting during the week from all the fantastic knowledge that we will listen to. So, Kedar Mate, now the CEO of IHI, and the former CEO of IHI, Don Berwick, will help us again. And it's a fantastic opportunity to have them on stage, even if it's digital. Why? Because they represent a system, an organization that has been a leader for us during the last 30 years. And even during this hard time, they have been the leaders. They have built a knowledge platform for COVID. They have developed a new digital approach so we see how we can be digital professionals. They have strengthened the networks globally. They have put us as a customer first and they think about the systems and not only the models and methods. So it's unbelievable that we now can continue to keep up our movement and network. And thanks a lot to IHI and of course to BMJ that now facilitate this. Don and Kedar are already historical because they now will lead us into the next generation of quality improvement. And let me just read a sentence from IHI's homepage, web page, and it says like this. When you come up on a wall, throw your hat over it, and then you get your hat back. At IHI, the spirit of this one little saying has inspired many big outcomes. So I look forward so much to a fantastic uh, dialogue between Kedar and Don, and I throw my hat now over the screen and let's have fun for 50 minutes. See you in 50 minutes. Thank you to our colleagues at the British Medical Journal for the invitation to present together as we open this most unusual of international forums. You'll see two faces during this hour. One very familiar, Dr. Donald Berwick, President Emeritus of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, who has regularly addressed this gathering for over 20 years. And was one less familiar, my own. For those that I'm meeting for the first time, my name is Kedar Mate. I'm a physician, an internist, and a professor at Cornell. And most importantly, I have the privilege of serving as IHI's newest president and CEO. It's been an honor for me to meet so many of IHI's partners and colleague improvers over the past few months since taking on this new role. And I look forward to meeting many more of you in the months and years to come. It's now commonplace to describe the circumstances in which we are all living as unusual and unprecedented. I won't add to those many colorful descriptions, which are certainly true. I will only stop here right at the beginning of this talk to recognize and thank every one of you for your efforts over the past six months to provide the very best care and service that we each knew how to provide to the millions of people that have moved through your service units, ER bays, operating theaters, and public health systems where you go to work every day. Almost everyone I know in healthcare has worked harder in these past six months than they have ever worked before. And so many of us have lost someone prematurely to the unremitting ravages of this global calamity. Amidst these circumstances, we have seen courageous improvers and systems thinkers working lockstep with clinical colleagues and public health officials 
to quickly and efficiently add resilience in ways that we were thought were inconceivable just weeks before the pandemic struck. I spoke to leaders in a large European metropolis recently who described a new citywide patient transportation system for COVID patients uh, between over a dozen hospitals and healthcare environments that would have taken years of back and forth to set up. In this case, it was set up and tested within hours. Many have seen the conversion of the Excel Center uh, in London, where this meeting has taken place in years past, and it was transformed into this un unbelievable state-of-the-art field hospital and ICU within a matter of days. These feats were accomplished by all of you, members of this community, applying quality and systems thinking to the challenges that COVID has presented. Still, I know there are concerns that both Don and I have heard in the past few months about whether quality and improvement is still relevant during this time, whether the methods that we work on matter today. Some doubts linger. Is QI quality improvement fast enough for the needs of our, that our modern systems face during a pandemic? Is it truly effective? Does it work at the scale of the challenges we face? In what areas, what new and different areas may our work on improvement succeed at scale? The legacy healthcare system has been put to the test uh, during COVID and may well be at the brink of something new. Our societies may be ready to renegotiate the social contract that has long been unquestioned with our healthcare institutions. And this may very well be the shot we have to make it anew. So where might we begin? Well, what Don and I want to do in the next 40 or so minutes is to consider these questions and provide our reflections on the moment that we are facing and the value of improvement during this time. We'll do this by considering six new paths where we believe the field of improvement can break new ground and lead us towards a new or a next normal that has built improvement in at its very foundations rather than adding it on as an extra feature in the future. So let's get started uh, on this uh, new set of paths for improvement. I'll start off and Don, if you'll uh, come in as well, we can have a dialogue about this going forward. Well, now let me just welcome Don into the conversation. Don, do you want to say hello? Thank you so much, Kater. It's a pleasure to join you. I'll extend my thanks as well to the British, Me uh, British Medical Journal group and uh, to all of you joining us in this meeting. I'm very excited and I look forward to, uh, to working with you through this, through this hour. Uh, and let me also say how pleased I am to be handing the reins of IHI over to Kater Monte. Kater, back to you. Well, thank you, Don. Well, so let's get started. So the first new path for improvement that Don and I imagined is uh, is this one, uh, something that I led off with in my first set of uh, talks and the first set of things that I committed to, I committed IHI's attention to, this idea that there is no quality without equity. Uh, nearly 20 years ago now, the committee that you led, Don, at the Institute of Medicine here in the U.S. invited all of us um, across the world to consider six new aims for a healthcare system of the future. That committee identified equity as one of the defining features of a remade system. And I think two decades later, by most measures, uh, we have not shown enough progress on this venerable and important aim. I IHI's vision statement was enshrined in its early days. That statement reads, everyone has the best care and health possible. And when we say everyone, truly, we should mean everyone. There can be no quality health system that systematically excludes some or many from the benefits of that system. There is no triple aim without equity. There can be no quality, uh, in our view, without equity going forward. Our legacy and our teaching as a community of improvers has been to start with the best and to create aspiration to pull the rest along. Uh, but when the worst performers, if you will, are systematically excluded from the conversation, prevented from the opportunity to reach the best systematically and structurally, I think it may be time to at least re-examine the premise. I, I've recently been studying the work of a professor, John Powell, a professor of law and ethnic studies at the University of California here in the US at Berkeley. Um, do, uh, professor Powell first articulated a framework that I think is, is useful to us at this time. That framework is called targeted universalism a theory that suggests that getting to universally held societal objectives, peace, better race relations, uh, 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 higher economic achievement, uh, such 
how uh, universally held social objectives uh, may require the use of targeted strategies to help advantage those that have been systematically disadvantaged. I think there's merit to this theory, and it could be readily blended with practical improvement methods to create better outcomes for everyone. IHI has been working now for years in low-income settings globally on this very issue, on creating more health equity, and with historically oppressed and excluded populations in the US, where the legacy of slavery and structured racism remains built into our very systems and foundations. IHI recently launched a new program, which we call Pursuing Equity, with 24 health systems that seeks to simultaneously make equity into a strategic priority for those systems, and who, uh, who are also now working on making meaningful and lasting improvements to specific inequities that we are seeing across a range of clinical conditions. Early data from that initiative and the prototype initiative that preceded it indicates that scientific improvement methods, which are designed to reduce variation when applied to inequities can, guess what? Reduce that systematic, unjust, unwarranted, and undesired variation. 20 years ago, IHI led the charge to make patient safety visible in healthcare. We did that by naming harms. I think we can name racism. We then measured those harms in rates of infection and injury. We can measure racism in disparities and injustices and inequities. And then we worked methodically together to eradicate those harms using disciplined improvement methods and science. And we must now do the same for the inequities we see in healthcare, make them visible and work to eliminate them. Inequities are not inevitabilities. We can and we will change them. Don, over to you. Thanks, Kedar. Um, I couldn't agree more. And um, IHI's commitment to and leadership in this field is going to be very important to the future. I have a question about emotion. A lot of um, improvement work that we do uh, is more or less objective. We have a problem, we solve it. This issue of equity relates, as you said, in the United States and elsewhere to racism and, uh, and uh, ethnically based disparities, and the result has been anger. We have in the United States people in the streets, as they should be, um, uh, protesting strongly about 400 year history of slavery. How do you as a leader um, think about the emotionality behind equity and get us over toward a sense of commonality in pursuing the goal? Well, I think there's a, I mean, first of all, I think a lot of that anger and emotion is entirely justified and appropriate and can be motivating and mobilizing. And so I think there's quite a lot of reason to preserve at least some aspects of the emotion that you describe and to build on it, to, to, to take that emotion and to uh, work with it, to channel it into the kinds of, I think, the kinds of work that we're seeing, you know, to, to actually work on the, uh, the, the determinants here of inequities and to kind of and work to solve the challenges that we're, we're having. What, I, what we found is that coupling that emotion, coupling that, that energy that that emotion brings to method, uh, the, the disciplined application of improvement, uh, is the special sauce of what it takes to overcome these challenges in the moment. But there's absolutely no avoiding the emotion. It's, it's a matter of, of, of marrying it in, in, in many ways to method. Uh, and, and the methods that we offer, I think, with improvement science in the quality world are exactly the methods that are necessary for tackling this unjust and unnecessary variation that we're seeing in systems. Thanks, that makes sense to me. I must say, in dialogue with uh, other leaders that are trying to deal with equity, sometimes I, they find themselves sort of on the firing line, the objects of emotion and anger that they didn't anticipate. And it's important to get through that and maybe convert it to positive energy, just like you say. Yeah, that's a good segue to the topic I'd like to address as our number two. Um, it has to do with um, social determinants of health. And I say at last. And the background here, as most of you know, is that healthcare, based on science and evidence, is a repair shop. Healthcare does not generally create health. We have eloquent testimony to this among researchers over decades past the Black Report in England, the wonderful work of Sir Michael Marmot. Uh, um, the uh, the work of Harry Burns in Scotland, for example, and more recently, Lord Nigel Crisp, healthcare is a repair shop. Uh, and if we uh, are treating a patient with an illness, we generally want to work on the cause. We try to discover what's the cause. And here we know the cause, that, that the generators of health and ill health, which we call sometimes social determinants of health, are massively important. Um, that's not news. 
uh, Sir Michael Marmot in his magnificent uh, book, The Health Gap in 2015, summarized uh, decades, if not a century, of research on what these social determinants are. Marmot categorized them, as I mentioned in prior talks at this conference, in, in five buckets. Um, the experiences of early childhood, which determine adult health as much as they do the, uh, the health of children. Uh, the education systems of our nations, uh, strong education systems that are equitable, <clears throat> focused on the needs of all children, um, seem to produce societies that live longer. Uh, the workplace, its safety, its meaning in work, uh, and uh, generous attitudes toward minimum incomes for families and individuals. Elder care and the way elders are treated in society are very, is very strongly correlated with overall societal longevity and health. And finally, community resilience, that is the uh, category that Marmot chooses to speak about things like transportation, housing security, food security, uh, violence and criminal justice, and uh, environmental threats, uh, for example, and more recently, climate change. To these five, Marmot adds a big sixth, he calls it the cause, the cause of the causes, and his word is fairness. It's the idea that we're committed to each other, and that echoes back in Kedar's comments on equity. Um, these are the drivers of well-being, and if we're if we're if we're a, a, a social enterprise committed to well-being, we have to work on them. Now that's not new. That's not new at all. The problem is neglect. But despite the fact we've had this evidence in country by country, including my own, we have not invested the with the energy that we need in altering the social determinants of health in favor of health. Instead, generally, healthcare has kind of sucked up the resources of society, and we are, find ourselves investing in the repair shop, not the causal systems. That's not totally true. IHI's amazing project called 100 Million Healthier Lives has uncovered literally thousands of bright spots, examples where the opposite has been the case. And indeed, in the UK itself, I, my own visits to the National Health Service have revealed many, many uh, areas that are trying to work on social determinants, but overall, we're not in balance. The dilemma really is, is this our business or not? Uh, is healthcare going to move toward health as a source of investment at last, or is it not? There are profound implications to the pursuit of social determinants of health, implications that echo in, of course, allocation of resources. Uh, where will the resources come from to make sure that everyone has housing and food security and that we fix our criminal justice systems and that the environment is clean and global warming stopped? While healthcare takes those resources, there's not a lot left over often in some countries or areas for investment in social determinants. Uh, this has structural implications. Our healthcare systems are not at the moment configured to work on these determinants, and therefore leaders often turn their turn away from it, say, I, I can't manage this. It's not, it's, I'm not equipped to do it. Some of the innovations we're seeing in structures, especially toward integrated systems, population-based systems, place-based systems, hold great potential here. There are implications uh, culturally around power distribution, because once we get into altering social determinants of health, we don't do that alone. We do it in partnership, full partnership, co-production with communities, and especially with neglected populations, those for whom the consequences are greatest. Are we ready to share control in such a way as to work on social determinants of health? And finally, and inevitably, there are political dimensions to this. The, strat the status quo has a lot of inertia. And in order to develop the will to change, to invest in altering social determinants favorably, we're going to have to actually shift resources in ways that are very uncomfortable, and that will be fought out in the political arena. I've recently written about the importance of checking our moral compass, uh, because I don't know where we're going to have the energy as communities to work on social determinants without asking profound questions about what kind of communities we want to be, is fairness, to use Marmot's word, a, a true guide to our future? Are we committed to the equity that Kara's been talking about? And that we're not going to find those answers in economic calculations or even strategic plans. They'll have to do with our moral, our moral compass. As I say, this isn't new, and it isn't new to improvement, but a really profound question here also, as Kedar teed up in his opening remarks, is does improvement have to do with this? That is, do the sciences of improvement, the, the ability to change using systematic, scientifically grounded quality improvement and quality planning and quality design, can we use these in this arena of improving social determinants of health? I deeply believe that we can, and I think that's a tremendous avenue for us to explore uh, now and for the future. Um, until this is solved. Don, thank you. Wow, that, that's a, a, I mean, I, 
Couldn't agree, of course, more. Right? That's why we're doing this together, uh, uh, of course. But I do have a question for you about the, you know, it's, uh, I think when we talk about social determinants, we often tend towards the big picture, the the the, the policy uh, questions, the social questions, the moral questions, as you have explored in your writing and in your thinking around uh, these issues. Um, my, my question for you is at the individual encounter level. Uh, so what can every one of us do um, in, in your view uh, to change how we consider the social needs of the, of the individual patient? What's the system practice? What's the habit that I should form as I uh, see my very next patient um, in, in my clinic? What's your thought on that? I love the question. I think that you have to think about approaching what creates health at a a kind of like different tiers, the, the political tier, the, mag, the, mag, the, 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 the major tier of nations, the tier of organizations and how they use the resources. But you're absolutely right. I think, it, I think every individual encounter in healthcare is a chance to begin to work on true causes. It has to do with our skill base as clinicians. Do we understand what needs to be inquired about? And do we have the skills to help connect people to the resources in their communities that sometimes can help them deal with stresses in their lives? Uh, it's to integrate to integrate concern and skill and time to address these social determinants uh, right into the, into the individual encounter. And of course, one of the most uncomfortable parts of the answer is to inspect uh, and interrogate ourselves about structural racism and prejudice in our own behaviors and backgrounds. None of us has escaped this. And so there's a bit of, um, a, 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 a bit of insight here that I think is needed at the individual at the individual level. Well, thank you for that, Don. It's, it's a, I think it's an incredibly important point. I, I you just need to figure out how to actually practice this. How do we practice differently? How do we how do we treat differently? How do we care for um, uh, our our patients, our families, our communities uh, holistically and differently than we've ever done before? Well, let's move to number three, uh, and, and here it is: extending our duty to care. Um, our, our duty to care must, in our view, uh, extend. It must go beyond the patient and family to the healthcare workforce. Rates of physical and psychological harm uh, have been on the rise well before COVID, exceeding any risks, exceeding risks in many instances of other what might be considered very harmful industries, manufacturing, mining, constructions, et cetera. Uh, COVID has only served to accelerate this need. Um, uh, Amnesty International back in early September reported that over 7,000 healthcare workers across the world had died of COVID-19. One nurses union in, in, in our country, in the US, put the US figure at, at in excess of 1,700 alone. Um, it's, it's just a massive uh, calamity that I think we're all feeling uh, worldwide. Uh, late last year, before COVID was fully upon us, I visited a large health system in Texas. Uh, I was speaking to, the, to my host there, the, the chair of medicine, and he had asked me about what IHI's priorities were these days. And I described this focus on safety and the well-being of the clinical workforce. And, and he paused me right there. And, and then in that moment, uh, tears uh, welling up in his eyes. I could tell I had struck on something emotional for him. And he, and he went on to describe that just a few months earlier, his wife of 30 years had been assaulted by a patient in an ambulatory clinic just miles from where we were sitting. The patient had come in for a, a routine visit and had been uh, had become agitated when he was asked to pay his copay, um, a, a, a different indictment of the affordability and challenge of our system, uh, and he couldn't afford that copay. So my host's wife, uh, the lead nurse administrator of the clinic, took the patient aside to explain the situation and work something out, and the patient proceeded to attack her, breaking her arm in three places and rendering her unconscious with a severe concussion from head trauma. Um, she'd been on leave ever, ever since that time, and he was distraught. The underlying conditions in our, in our health and care environments were already unsafe for the workforce uh, prior to COVID, and there is much work that we can all do in this arena. IHI's Leadership Alliance, something that, Don, you're very close to and involved with, last year, in response to the rising rates of harm and injury and psychological unsafety in the clinical work environment, kicked off a working group with 30 health systems now all focused on identifying where the evidence was around these issues, evidence-based interventions that could enhance physical and psychological safety, uh, and not just find the evidence, but put those pieces of evidence into practice to start reducing that harm, injury, and psychological unsafety in the workforce. 
That group now regularly tracks serious harm events within the workforce in their data. Um, and their data indicates across those 30 systems that COVID has led to spiking rates of, of workforce harm and injury. IHI's Joy and Work team has also focused its energies on enhancing the well being and resilience of the workforce during this time. IHI published guidance on this um, during the early stages of the COVID pandemic, in which they described the need for psychological PPE, not just the physical PPE, the gowns and gloves and masks and so on that we needed, but also the need for psychological PPE to help protect healthcare workers and help support all of us and help us support one another during these troubling times. And last month, IHI and 27 patient safety partner organizations published the National Action Plan for Patient Safety, which recognized the critical interconnectedness between patient safety and workforce safety. A workforce that is safe, joyful, and not afraid will be capable of providing care that is safer, defect-free, and more empathetic and compassionate. The plan makes clear that workforce safety can't be an add-on, it's not an afterthought, it's in fact a prerequisite, a precondition, as Paul O'Neill once described, for safe and effective patient care. Healthcare's most precious resource is its people, and COVID has demonstrated in tragic detail severe threats to the workforce. But this is not a new story. Working in healthcare has always been fraught with risks to physical and psychological safety, and we have to leverage this moment, the urgency of this moment, to once and for all, I believe, rid our systems of all types of harm and give our workforces the safety and supports they need to fulfill their calling as, as healers. John. Yeah, you mentioned Paul O'Neill, a great mentor to IHI from years past. Uh, he was relentless about this. We couldn't get through a conversation without him mentioning safety of the workforce as a precondition, he said, just as you said, um, to, uh, to, to excellence. You know, Kidar, this is an example, uh, by the way, of uh, an extension of the concept of safety itself that I find interesting. I wonder if you would comment on it. It's to incorporate psych psychological safety, that is the sense of well-being, not just physical safety, generally in our, in our work, that, that um, when we produce alienation or a sense of exclusion or a sense of fear or questions not answered, that is a safety issue. And I wonder what you think about extending the concept of safety into that psychological space. Yeah, I, I absolutely believe that the the notion here. I mean, that the literature bears this out, right? If you if you have a workforce that is uh, feels unsafe, feels fearful, feels like it's under attack, it is far more likely to create uh, literal errors in the work, literal defects in the work, and and it leads to rework and waste, um, in addition to harm and injury uh, to the to the patients and families that we work with and serve. So there is absolutely no question in my mind that a safe and effective and psychologically safe workforce is a precondition, as Paul uh, uh, eloquently described, to, to making this happen. One, one other thing that we've uh, encountered a lot is the notion that perhaps there should be a fourth aim to the triple aim, one that focuses or centers on the notion of a safe workforce or a, uh, a better workforce or a cared for workforce. And while we, while we regularly uh, believe that as well, I think that the notion that we have is that uh, this is not a, a aim for the system overall, but is in fact a precondition. The notion, notion of a safe and effective uh, uh, workforce um, is a precondition for achieving this, the triple aim uh, going forward. Don, over to you. Yeah, the, I, that corresponds to my experience in, in leadership overall. Uh, you've got to attend to the needs of the workforce or you can't get your job done. No, no one's really the boss. You, all you can do is support people who do the work that adds meaning to their lives as right. you also said. Uh, so the next topic is actually related uh, to safety. It has to do with speed. Uh, this is a COVID era um, teaching, a uh, uh, 15 gene virus uh, taking us to school. Uh, what's happened in, um, in the COVID era is a tectonic shift in attitudes, capabilities, and behaviors around tempo. Uh, as a, as a as a advocate for improvement, one of the great questions in improvement always has been, why so slow? Why don't, why can't we, if we know what to do, why don't we implement it right now? And, and as simple as that question is, the answer has been very, very hard. And then COVID hits. And in this pandemic, I'm seeing tempos I've never seen before. Let me give you a few examples. Kadar also, already you mentioned one, which is a tempo and reorganization of care flows, the story of the setting up of the uh, Excel Center into, into a Nightingale 
intensive care capability was awesome. And that was three weeks from deciding to make the Excel Center a 2,900 bed intensive care unit to it, the first patient being admitted. Now that did not actually need to be used in response, but it was ready to be used at a, at a rate no one could have imagined. I'm involved with publication. I'm on the General Oversight Committee of the American Medical Association, I, and I've been on the editorial board of JAMA. JAMA's Cycle Times, the Journal of the American Medical Association Cycle Times for review and publication of papers are now, uh, I don't know if it's an order of magnitude faster, but pretty close to that. Things that would have taken weeks or months now take literally hours. Uh, I submitted a paper myself just um, a couple days ago. Uh, it was accepted within about two hours. I've never seen that before. Uh, the National Academy of Medicine here in the United States produces a pedigreed reports um, that usually take about 18 months uh, between the setting up of the standing committee on uh, emerging infections uh, and 21st century threats uh, in March of this year in response to the pandemic. Uh, between the setting up of that committee and the issuing of its first 11 reports took one month. Um, we're seeing uh, information speed around the world as uh, physicians in Seattle speak to intensive care doctors in Wuhan and absorb their lessons learned. My own daughter's a hospitalist uh, here in, in Boston, and uh, she uh, is a, has access to a, to a reference, essentially a, a social networking of reference about how to take care of COVID patients that works at light speed, literally. Um, and of course, the pace of the adoption of virtual care, uh, going from near zero to near 100% for virtual care in some disciplines, in many organizations, almost literally overnight. This is really exciting and it's really scary because as this kind of tempo incre increases, uh, the question we're faced with is what do we keep and what do we not keep in the future? I personally am excited by the tempo. I think it is the way to be. I think we can find um, appropriate gates, uh, hit the brakes when we need to, but actually allow improvement to move at a, at a pace and scale I've never seen before. But we have to keep our wits about us. And the questions that arise are what forms of discipline and scrutiny and reflection uh, and caution need to apply when we are moving at such tempo. This is appearing, of course, very vividly in the policy arena around uh, treatments and vaccines, because under the sense of urgency that both governments and uh, professionals are feeling, we want to reach for these helpful things as fast as we can, uh, and sometimes feels a little bit uh, obsessive to, to demand that there be evidence behind what we do. Of course, as a scientist, I think we should. So we've got a balancing act here, how to move fast and how to remain prudent as we move fast. I think that the quality improvement methods that we're talking about throughout this hour are very, very relevant. I, I personally believe that the approaches of a modern improvement science uh, are up to the task here. In fact, maybe the only way to learn with discipline at this tempo, because there's not time in many cases for the formal experimentalist approach, the randomized trial approach to some of the changes we want to make. We have to learn as we go. And what we know from quality sciences is if you track data over time, use appropriate methods of inference, you can learn over time quickly, far more quickly than we can with formal, uh, formal experimental designs. These are democratized science as a platform for rapid learning. Well, thank, thank you, Don. I, I, I couldn't agree more that the speed is both wonderful and you know, unbelievable to witness, and yet also sort of simultaneously alarming in, in some sense. Uh, uh, but but the, on balance, I think very exciting to to watch. Um, I guess a, a question for you here is is about the our, our capacity to absorb the speed. Uh, you know, data and sci you know the the, the 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 ways in which our systems are built are moving faster than ever before. Will human organizational systems really be capable of adapting as quickly as they have? And, and, and honestly, how do we stop from getting exhausted? Uh, you know, the, the pace of this is frenetic. The energy, I remember speaking to you in the early days and just how tired both of us were, uh, quite honestly, uh, because we'd been working 24, 20 hour days, you know, and, and getting what kind of sleep we could get in the meantime. That pace can't continue, right? So how do we, how do we balance this, uh, the speed, the tempo that you're describing against the sense that we could just wear ourselves out. I think it's a big threat and I, se I sense the fatigue and it's coming of course from the, the, the burdens of care, the balancing of family obligations and uh, work obligations for our clinical workforce, for example. 
Uh, I read everything I can through the day, but I can't absorb 10% or 5% of what crosses my desk just about the latest news about vaccine development or uh, patient care or post-COVID sequelae. I, I try to learn, but I can't keep up with it. Um, I think we're going to have to get smart about this, and I think there, I think there may be some, some answers around um, uh, miss, a missing role at the moment or one that's incompletely filled around curation of knowledge. Uh, I, I think there is a uh, there is a, a sort of an empty chair so far for for organizations that are trustworthy organizations that can absorb this flow, set up really structurally to digest it, and then put this put the knowledge out in forms that can be more easily digested. We we're 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 really uh, running as fast as we can, but it's it's important to pause to pause at some point and take take up this curation issue seriously. We're seeing some of it happen. Uh, the, the, I think the World Health Organization, there's a lot of credit for setting up platforms for exchange of knowledge. There are uh, major academic medical centers that are trying to do this, but we've got, a, we've got a job ahead. The potential role of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and decision supports also needs to be viewed here. We haven't had time to set up the decision support systems for the care of COVID patients and the post-COVID sequelae, but that has to be coming, and we've got we've to do that. The workforce can't, the human brain, can't work at the pace that the generation of knowledge in COVID is would currently imply. Well, the, well, the concept of the brain, I think, is sort of slowly expanding to include the collection of uh, cognitive capacity across, uh, well, across any kind of boundary now. I mean, the, 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 the total human capacity to absorb is, we saw this in the very early stages of the pandemic where our, our leadership alliance, 50 some odd systems across the U.S., um, and indeed, there's a European alliance, of course, that was doing something similar with 30 health systems across Europe, rapidly trading knowledge on, on organizational policy, on clinical findings, on, uh, on a variety of other uh, issues that were surfacing during this time. No one person or no one system could have done all that on its, on its own. It, it needed that collective brain, as it's sometimes referred to. Well, uh, we're getting close to the end of our uh, list here, but let's. there's two more items. Uh, getting real about scale. IHI and its community of improvers has long thought about how to reach scale, and a lot of what John just talked about in the speed of change is, uh, is pertinent here to this discussion about scale. And, and we, like many of you, have published and applied frameworks for getting past pilot or past the initial prototype or often incremental first steps of an improvement initiative. And what has been observed, however, during this time that we're all living in, has been scale like we've never seen before, and at a tempo, as Don just said, that we've never seen before. And in part, this has been due to the combination of, I think, three primary features of this moment. Focus, technology, and networks. COVID brought about absolute razor-sharp focus. Uh, more than anything else in my lifetime, this was the thing that everyone from my 99-year-old grandfather to my four-year-old daughter that everyone was focused on in this moment. One major problem, multiple facets, of course, but one clear and consistent global mission, clear intent, as uh, military leaders will describe, complete leadership clarity. And that focus and everyone walking arm in arm across health systems and indeed across entire cities, states, and countries uh, led to our ability to tackle this challenge in the way that we have. Where we were most coordinated, focused, aligned, and guided by the evidence and available science, and I'm being clear about those things and speaking from the U.S., there's some irony in that comment, but where we were most coordinated, focused, aligned, and guided by the evidence, we were most successful globally in the aggregate. Where we weren't, we have struggled, and that remains true here, especially in the U.S., where we have struggled uh, in many ways with these issues. Technology enabled mass mobilizations, some of the things that Don described, at a scale we've never seen before. And we learned, we learned faster and shared more. Uh, we joined Twitter armies that faced off against COVID and Facebook legions that created reams of virtual information about how to care for our patients better than we've ever seen. And our networks mattered. We leveraged them in the way that I just described with the Leadership Alliance to help each other uh, from everything from procurement of needed supplies to procurement of knowledge and understanding. It, it, on balance, there was a, a massive networked effort here. In the improvement world, there have been concerns about whether we can get to scale with what we do. Um, and so we sought to understand how to accelerate today faster than we've ever seen before. And that led us to partner uh, with an organization called Project Echo. This is an academic-based organization. It's, it's based out of the University of New Mexico. And if you haven't met Project Echo, 
and its amazing founder, Dr. Sanjeev Arora, I would commend you to it. It's an, it's an incredible place. The, the organization uh, uses technology. Echo uses technology, a uh, platform much like this one, and a coaching model, uh, even more importantly, to connect clinical subspecialists in a hub location, usually an academic center, with primary care doctors in the spokes, out in rural and remote places, the idea being that the hub can coach the spokes to take better care of patients in those areas. They started with a single clinical condition. Dr. Aurora is a hepatologist, and so he started with hepatitis C. At the time when he started, he was one of two hepatologists in the state of New Mexico that could treat hepatitis C. And of course, there were thousands of patients all over the state that needed his attention. And so he worked with primary care docs and he coached them and taught them how to treat hep C. And in the end, his findings, his results were no different than theirs. He had created equivalents across the entire state through the ECHO platform. Now the system works in over 100 clinical conditions in over 40 countries via 450 academic centers and hubs. Their growth has been enormous. The scale of their impact has been incredible. And so as we started to learn in the early days of the pandemic that COVID disproportionately kills older adults and especially those living inside of, of care homes uh, where the knowledge of how to manage the clinical condition was limited and the system's thinking and approach and QI ability was limited, we thought we needed to do something. And our question was, how can we both increase clinical knowledge at the scale of the problem, get to every nursing home in the country simultaneously and quickly, and ensure reliable implementation of the guidance that CDC and Medicare and Medicaid, our federal government, was offering? So we struck up a partnership between IHI and ECHO, um, and the goal of which is to reach every single nursing home in the country, all 15,000 locations with a combination of best-in-class clinical understanding, what it takes to prevent the infection from entering these settings, how to mitigate its impact if it's already there, how to treat mild and asymptomatic cases of COVID in, in care homes, uh, and how to marry that knowledge with best-in-class quality improvement knowledge to support the reliable implementation of the guidance uh, of that know-how. It's now unfolding across the country at a breathtaking pace and a breathtaking scale. Uh, one that we could not have imagined before this time. Tom. I am so excited about that project and uh, both the goal and the, the pace it's acquired. Of course, we had a taste of this in the past couple of years in our work with the John A. Hartford Foundation uh, in our age-friendly health systems uh, project, uh, uh, which Kadar helped lead. Um, I have a question about that one because something mysterious happened. Uh, this is a project to extend uh, scientific knowledge about proper care for elders to hundreds of hospitals, eventually thousands, and health systems in the United States. When COVID hit, we expected everything to shut down. Uh, I, you know, our our uh, conferences had to either go away or turn virtual. Projects were hit, put on pause. This one didn't. Uh, the pace and scale of the uh, age-friendly age health systems project, I think it accelerated as COVID took over, and it was a mystery to me. Have you thought, Kedar, about why that project had so much uh, energy and maybe what we can learn from that in terms of the work we're now going to be doing with the ECHO project? Well, you know, I think there's a couple of things going on there. One, you know, the, the need became, the burning platform was ignited, if you will. You know, older adults were dying more often than any other part of the, as a pr proportion of the population, we're dying far more often than any other part of the population. Um, and the notion was that the, the evidence-based care practices in the age-friendly health system were potentially part of the answer. There were ways of keeping patients, older adults, um, uh, well cared for outside of institutional environments. How can we take better care for them in our ambulatory care centers? How can we take better care for them at home? Um, and I think the other uh, the other aspect of this, uh, so so I think attention and energy was redoubled on the care of older adults in this time. and and you know, one of the other things we saw was that the opportunity to to create uh, spread investment uh, of health systems in, in in measures that would do anything to protect older adults was redoubled during this time. So I think that age friendly health system became a vehicle, became a way. Of, of channeling attention and energy towards older adults in a systematic way that not only brought COVID guidance to them and, and evidence to, uh, to bear on that population, but also simply put, was a, a mechanism of taking better care for a period of, of older adults during this time. And it was a, it was a very, it, one of the anchor strategies is understanding what matters to the older adult in question. 
And a lot of that had to do with enabling health systems to, to discharge older adults more quickly, get them into a care environment or into a safer environment that was closer to their home environment, which was, I think, critical to the spread of the, of the initiative. Uh, the, the, the ability to work on care homes, on elder care, on home care uh, for elders, um, nursing homes, uh, has eluded us for decades. It's an, a major unsolved problem. And the idea that we're moving creatively into this space is really, really exciting. And, it, and it's international, from Singapore to Seattle, everyone's fretting about how we're going to do better for our elders. So I'm really excited about this project, Kadar. Sure. Uh, let me move to our final topic. Uh, kind of be careful what you wish for. At, at a meeting I uh, was at and spoke at um, about a year and a half ago, I guess, uh, I somewhat casually uh, uh, created a phrase that just popped into my mind at the moment. The phrase was, is the office visit a dinosaur? This was pre-COVID. This was before we had to move to virtual care. But I, I for some reason, begun to concern, be concerned about overuse of care as a major issue in the office visit, as an example. I'd seen some uh, tremendous examples of virtual care. Well, to my horror, that was taken seriously. And in the Leadership Alliance, a project started called Is the Office Visit a Dinosaur? And its project is very vibrant right now, figuring out, well, how much do we actually need the visits we thought we needed? That's actually a bigger and more encompassing topic. What is the care that we thought we needed but didn't need? We've known about overuse as an international issue in healthcare for decades now. Uh, there was a Lancet series just two years ago, uh, edited by Shannon Brownlee and her colleagues, uh, uh, going over the international global images of overuse of unnecessary care. Uh, COVID has actually called the question. Uh, indirectly uh, in some ways, but uh, we know about the um, surge of virtual care that Kedar and I already talked about. That virtual care is replacing office visits and face-to-face -face encounters that up to that point we would have thought were absolutely necessary. In addition, because of COVID, people are not coming in for care that is thought to be needed because they're frightened of getting infected or their mobility has decreased because of restrictions in their communities. There are lessons here. What is the care that we have habitually used, especially in systems which are based on fee-for-service payment, which of course encourages volume of care? What is the care that we thought was needed that in fact really wasn't? Some examples for me include the periodicity assumptions. Uh, when you see someone with a problem, it's customary for a physician to say, come back and see me. Let's check up on you. Uh, when we do uh, checkups, we say, let's come in, please come in and see me once a year. Uh, the periodicity of an annual checkup, remember, has been set by the astronomical fact of how long it takes the uh, Earth to go around the sun. It doesn't have much to do with biology or, uh, or um, analytic approaches to knowing exactly how often we should be checked. Uh, there are issues about proximity. Uh, do we actually have, how close do we have to be to someone to actually help them? Teledermatology has taken off, and I don't know if it'll ever go back now since we can send images that can be treated without any physical encounter. Telepsychiatry is thriving right now, although there are some reports that I've heard about the need to be physically with patients that are getting psychotherapy. A lot of psychiatrists now have, have moved to 100% telepsychiatry, and so far the results look quite promising. What about time as a healer? Tincture of time, we used to call it during my training. What about waiting as a test instead of an encounter uh, as an intervention? What about the use of home and home-based care? In the UK, many of you pioneered with hospital at home, but that's now become a much more conventional idea that we can move pretty intensive care to home settings without using the infrastructures, the very expensive and dangerous infrastructures of our, of our own hospitals. What is the care we thought we needed but it turns out we didn't. Of course, there's a double edge to this because there's definitely some care that we do need in which it's hazard, hazardous to omit it, in which COVID has kept patients from showing up with their ST elevated myocardial infarctions or aggravations of pulmonary diseases that really do need intervention. We're gonna have to get smart about this. Its economic implications are profound in one way at least, which is will virtual care, which is now taken over in many settings, become in the longer run an addition on top of the visit-based care we've had, or will it actually be a substitute? substitute that has both clinical and economic implications. My own hope is that this becomes a major research enterprise. We have an experiment of nature underway here. Our hand has been forced, and if we're smart, we'll be able to reflect back on the care avoided during COVID 
and ask questions about substitution and elimination of care that we thought we needed, but really didn't. It's pretty exciting terrain, and I think we've only begun to to harvest what we might learn. Well, well, that, Don, I think I hope you're right about uh, about that, and that we do have the confidence and clarity to to make that evaluation and assessment of the care that we uh, really didn't need during this time. It, what would give you confidence? So, what would I mean, one of the things I, I wonder about is with this question is that the forces, the status quo forces that operate in our health systems are very strong. They're very powerful. And even in the summer lull, as we sort of saw here in the U.S. at least and elsewhere in the world, we saw a return to action in some ways in, in hospitals and health systems uh, and, and, and a return to some of the care that we didn't need. In fact, an emphasis on the care that we didn't need in many ways. What do we, what do, we do to prevent that? What do we do for, to prevent the status quo forces from reorganizing and rubber banding us back to the way we were uh, before this all started? Well, as I said, I think scientific research will help, and I'm looking to the health services research community to really take this opportunity seriously. I think it's a big opportunity for learning. Beyond that, we have to question our financing systems. This is, of course, is more a U.S. issue than elsewhere, but what we saw during the COVID period was the organizations that were able to really be um, uh, appropriately responsive to move quickly to new configurations and then support those configurations are the ones that were paid on other than fee-for-service grounds. And so though I think you could make an argument that fee-for-service payment can be tweaked or, or molded to support the new configurations of care that are more frugal, more appropriate to actual needs, uh, I personally think that as we move more toward global budgets and uh, population-based thinking, we're going to get the balance right. I have, been, I, I have been and remain excited about what's happening in the English National Health Service around the development of integrated care systems, which really would be configurations that are based on population-based needs in which we can ask really intelligent questions about what really helps people and what we thought helped them, but actually doesn't. Well, well thank you. Don, so there, there you have it, our uh, Don and Kedar's trail map, if you will, for the pads. We both like to hike and be in nature, so we labeled this the pads for, for improvement. But here you have it, the new pads, our trail map uh, that we could travel together with all of you in the next few years, some of which we're already uh, treading right now. It's in part inspired by COVID and the pressure of these times, but it's also inspired, I think, by the creativity and hard work of so many of you that have at every turn met the challenge that we face with dedication and inspiration in equal measure. Uh, to the question of whether it is time to cast improvement in the scientific disciplines of quality aside and search for new methods that can carry us far forward, Don and I answer in unison a wholehearted no. For as long as we have looked carefully at how systems were managing through this pandemic, we saw everywhere the hallmarks of high reliability, of system thinking, of new forms of learning and testing. We saw in every corner rapid cycle testing or PDSAs playing out. We saw clear emphasis on real time learning and proving effectiveness in real life and in real time. We saw the focus on scale as we talked about here. We saw the coupling together of a disciplined array of efforts linked to a common aim in this case, tackling COVID. We saw emphasis on cross-sector mobilization and collaboration. We built a true learning, global uh, learning laboratory aimed at whole system transformation. Which part of W. Edwards Deming's theory of profound knowledge is not being used here? We are thinking about the system, the whole system in this case. We're building knowledge in real time. We're learning from variation at scale, at the scale of the whole globe in this case. And we are forming teams faster than ever. This was precisely Deming's theory, now playing out on a global stage and at a pace and tempo that we have perhaps never considered before. Prior to taking this job at the helm of IHI, I led IHI's innovation team. And for years, we used a relatively simple principle to help us create new models, uh, a principle that I learned from Don and, and Tom Nolan uh, as well. It's, it's a, it's a, it, the principle is to remove accepted system faults. The design of the triple aim emerged from this, the simple idea that the aims of better health better care and lower costs do not compete with each other, which was the previously accepted dogma, but in fact, they reinforce each other. And perhaps the most incredible characteristic of this time has been the fact that during this pandemic, we have reconsidered accepted truths. We used to believe that coordination across a whole city's health system was impossible, now no longer. We used to believe that we couldn't develop science in real time, now we do. We may have once thought that work that was relevant in the global south, as it's sometimes known, was irrelevant to the global north. 
Now we don't. It's all one big, massive coordinate effort. We are living that reality today. And what's more, the spirit, mission, and purpose of improvement is at the heart of everything that we do. So we thank you for your time today and for your uh, great work together. And we look forward to being in dialogue with you over the course of this meeting and many other to come. John, do you want to say the last word? Thank you, Kadar, for your leadership. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we've got to get through this together. There's no other way. And hopefully, if we keep our wits about us, uh, use our methods and tools, remain uh, with a sense of solidarity and compassion for each other, we'll emerge stronger. Thank you all. Thank you. You're live. <laughs> Hello, everyone. What a fantastic dialogue or dialogue and speech we have got for 50 minutes. Kedar and Don, thank you very much. You. I would love to ask you one question. If you now would have been a leader in a regular health and care system, what actions would you like to do first of all based on your six um, components? And Kedar, you as the leader of a knowledge organization, what, would, what advices should you give? Well, uh, thank you, Joran, and again, thank you for the privilege of being with all of you today. Uh, I'm sorry we can't be in person, but uh, what an honor to be with you. Uh, Joran, to answer your question, I, I think there's a, a couple of things that come to mind right away. Uh, one is that we've tried a lot of different things during this time. So I would say set up a system within your system to manage the creativity and the innovations that have taken place during this period. Learn what's worked during this time and also figure out uh, what should be sunset. As, as Don said, there's lots of things that we did before that we didn't really need to do. So figure out what should be ended and, and then take those actions, sunset them, end them. Uh, the second area that I would consider is to take care of your people. I, I mentioned it in the talk. Uh, this is a very challenging time for uh, healthcare workers uh, throughout organizations throughout the world. Um, and it's not just the work itself. The work itself of caring and taking care of people has been harder, is harder than ever right now. But there's also life outside of it. We have so much going on right now in an individual's life, uh, managing and dealing with COVID. Uh, simple trips to the grocery store have become challenging. Uh, school for school-aged children has become very difficult. Uh, so it's a lot to manage in addition to the job of taking care of people inside of health systems and hospitals and, and clinics. So support the physical safety, the psychological safety, and indeed the ability of your workforce to, to, to work at this time. Uh, it's really important to consider. And then the last thing I'll just say is invest in quality. Um, you know, this is probably an obvious statement, but try not to be seduced by the, the forces that are very powerful of cost cutting and uh, austerity and revenue acquisition at all costs. I think organizations that uh, will emerge from this stronger than ever before are those that will have us in the path of quality. Um, so thank you for the opportunity again. Don, what you, are your uh, steps? Peter and I did not get to talk about this in advance, but my, I, I have the identical answer written down. Uh, take care of your workforce. There's healing to do here. It's got to be, we've got to be healed as a, as a group. And second, reflect, reflect systematically. Kater and I have given you six categories. You could organize that way, but I think this is a time to say, what did we learn? What do we want to keep and what do we want to toss? And the final point is, let's stay global. Um, the countries are not isolated from each other now. We've been connected. Let's stay connected just like we are at this forum. Thanks, thanks so much for the chance to join you. Thank you very much, both of you, once again. And on behalf of all the audience, thank you. And uh, let's have a good week together. Thank you.